Welcome back to the final part of this video. So we are taking our Necromancer that is a Kobold. From levels 1 through 20, we have done two parts of this video already. Uh, levels 1 through 4 in part 1, levels 5 through 10 in part 2. As I mentioned, Necromancers really don't start to feel like Necromancers until we start raising undead. That starts happening at level 6 with this character. But since then, we've really seen a boost to that with Danse Macabre as well. So now we can raise undead during combat that just complement the undead we already have, and they're even more powerful. But we can still do all our wizard things. We still have Wall of Force, we still have Counter Spell, we still have Autoluke's Resilient Sphere, we still have Mirror Image. Uh, so we're still very much a wizard, but we're using undead to complement that. But for the final part of this video, we're going to jump two levels at a time. Uh, when we get to 18th level, I just want to talk a lot about what happens at 17th level, because of course we get our 9th level spells, which is a big deal for any wizard but for this wizard in particular. So as we go from 10th level up to 12th level, uh, we're going to get our next ability score improvement and we're just going to keep boosting our intelligence now. Now we want to get our intelligence up to 20. Remember, this actually affects the power of that Dance Macabre spell as well because it's adding to their attacks and damage. That's five attacks and five damage rolls every round in addition to affecting our spell DCs, in addition to affecting our preparations. It's really kind of an obvious choice here. We're going to get our six level spells at this point. I'm going to be selecting four spells at a time here because we're jumping two levels at a time. And the six level spells I want, first off, I wanted to get Contingency. Now, I usually pair Contingency with Dimension Door. This character doesn't have Dimension Door, so I can't do that. But it is good to pair with Autoluke's Resilient Sphere as well. This is actually a favorite of a lot of people already. Uh, I like it less because of the concentration requirement, but I do think it's good for this character uh, because we can do a lot when we're not concentrating because we have all our undead minions. So setting up an Autoluke's Resilient Sphere at a certain hit point threshold uh, is a great way to shore up the defense of this character. The next thing I'm going to grab is Scatter, uh, because I don't have Dimension Door and I don't have Thunder Wave, because my small size actually makes those less effective. Scatter is a great way for me to get around that. It uses a higher level spell, but it allows me to rearrange the tactics on the battlefield for up to five creatures. We can even move creatures that are enemies if they fail a Wisdom Saving Throw. Makes sense that we might choose a couple allies and a few enemies. Have the enemies make their saving throws and the allies we can move them to advantageous positions. We may even want to do it on our undead. The next spell I want to take is Soul Cage. Uh, Soul Cage is not something we get a particular advantage from uh, as a Necromancer. But I do think it's really appropriate for a Necromancer, and it's a Necromancy spell, and it's a good spell, and I've taken it on other wizards, and I think it's good for this one too. And if we're a bad Necromancer that goes around killing humanoids to get our bodies and our skeletons for our spells, you shouldn't be a bad wizard, but if you are, I might look the other way. Then we can use our Soul Cage in combination with that as well. And of course I'll take the Create Undead spell, because I am a Necromancer. So I will take the Create Undead spell, Remember that we still do get our bonus from our Undead Thralls here when it comes to hit points and when it comes to damage. We don't get the additional creature. So we can choose up to three corpses, medium or small humanoids within range. Each becomes a ghoul under our control. So if we compare the ghoul to the zombies and the skeletons, we got our speed of 30 feet, 22 hit points. So this is closer to what we would expect in terms of zombie hit points, but skeleton speed. We get a bite attack, plus 2, 2d6, plus 2 damage, or more likely our claw attack. This is our better attack. Plus 4 to hit, uh, and it does 2d4 slashing damage. If the creature is other than elf or undead, it must succeed on a DC 10 constitution saving throw or be paralyzed for one minute. Target can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect on itself on a success. Now, DC 10 is easy right? Uh, I mean, creatures are probably going to have plus six, plus seven constitution saving throws. But we get three ghouls going, three attacks. Uh, creatures could be making a lot of constitution saving throws. Eventually, the DM is going to roll a one or a two or a three, and they're going to end up failing that saving throw, and then you paralyze the creature. You paralyze them without concentration. So it's like a whole monster without that whole concentration requirement. Now it's likely only going to last a round, but a round is still a big deal for paralyzation. Uh, and then we can combine it with the ghoul. So I still think that Create Undead is a good choice for this Necromancy Wizard. Now it's not necessarily always the way I'm going to spend my 6th level spell. 
but I definitely would consider it because it is a one minute casting time. Just like with Animate Dead, this isn't something we cast in the middle of combat. We have to cast it beforehand. Like with Animate Dead, after 24 hours, we cast this spell again and it allows us to maintain control. Unlike Animate Dead, it doesn't allow us to control more creatures than we can create. It's three and three. Now this spell does scale with level. Uh, so if we use it with a seventh level slot, we get four ghouls. I don't think that's worth a whole spell level, one extra ghoul. Uh, when we use an eighth level spell slot, we can animate or research control over five ghouls or two ghasts or whites. I would never choose a ghast over a white. A white is going to be a far better choice here. Now, I don't necessarily want to use my eighth level slot on creating a couple whites, but they're not bad. Just note that a white has 45 hit points base. We're going to get our additional bonus to that equal to our level. They have a number of resistances that are going to come up commonly. The resistant to necrotic, that doesn't come up much. But bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks means that for most combats, we're going to effectively have twice as many hit points. And the white can attack twice per round. Uh, and they have a longbow attack. So they can do plus four to hit for 1d8 plus two piercing damage. But of course, we're increasing that by a proficiency bonus. Or if we want to go into melee, they can do a longsword attack and their life drain attack. And longsword attack is similar, except it's doing d10 plus two damage. Assuming they're using the longbow with two hands, don't know why they wouldn't. Uh, and then you get your life drain is plus four to hit, uh, d6 plus two necrotic damage, they succeed on a constitution saving throw, or their hit point maximum is reduced. The thing I want to point out about this is there's an abuse av available. Just so you know, uh, a humanoid slain by this attack rises 24 hours later as a zombie under the white's control. Unless the humanoid is restored to life or its body is destroyed. The white can have no more than 12 zombies under its control at one time. So if you use your 8th level slot to create two whites, and then those whites go and kill a bunch of humanoids with their life drain, and they can bring up to 12 of them back. And as long as we maintain control of those whites, then those whites can each maintain the control of those 12 zombies. So you have additional 24 zombies. Now, if I'm your DM, I would say, although indirectly you could state that you created those zombies, directly you definitely didn't. So I wouldn't give them the bonus from Undead Thralls. But I just thought I would mention that. Do I want to use my 8th level slot to create a couple whites? Probably not. I have so many undead already. Uh, a couple whites, they're certainly tougher than anything else I can make. So it's tempting. And if I really want to concentrate on dead, if this is something I'm having a lot of fun with, then maybe. It's not like 8th level spell slots are untouchable. Uh, but I do think there are better things we can do with 8th level slots. But let's go back to 6th level spells. And so... When we talk about preparation, we now have three additional preparations. We're not going to need to prepare contingency. We're going to cast it when we're not adventuring. So we can prepare our Create Undead, our Scatter, and our Soul Cage all at the same time. So defensively, huge boost because we've added our contingency. And then with Create Undead, we can make more powerful undead and even more undead to join the many others we've got. Remember, as our spell slots increase, we have additional options. We're not limited to just our third level slots. If we want to throw a fourth level slot or a fifth level slot into an animate dead, we can, and remember, it does scale. But what I would recommend with tactics is that we don't put all our eggs in one basket. I recommend you have those undead. Have them there, use them for an offensive boost, but also use your other spells. Save some slots so you can do your walls of force, so you can do your scatters, so you can do your other things uh, so that those undead, instead of being the only thing you do, they complement what you can already do as a wizard. So let's keep things going, go to level 14. We are going to get our final necromancer ability, Command Undead. Starting at 14th level, you can use magic to bring undead under your control, even those created by other wizards. As an action, you can choose one undead you can see within 60 feet of you. That creature must make a charisma saving throw against your wizard spell, DC. If it succeeds, you can't use this feature on it again. If it fails, it becomes friendly to you and obeys your commands until you use this feature again. Intelligent undead are harder to control this way. If the target has an intelligence of 8 or higher, it has advantage on the saving throw. If it fails a saving throw at, and it has an intelligence of 12 or higher, it can repeat the saving throw at the end of every hour until it succeeds and breaks free. So this means that undead with an intelligence of 12 or higher, uh, if we use this ability on the, them, 
even if they fail, which they probably won't, but even if they do, then they're going to get another saving throw every hour. Now I can't discuss every situation, but I would definitely use this ability. If I go up against undead, I'm going to use it. And if it's a creature with low intelligence, great. And if it's a creature with a higher intelligence, there's less of a chance of it working. But if it does work, especially if they're under 12 intelligence, just by not using this feature again, I now have a permanent undead minion. How good could this be? Well, we can't control that because we don't know what we're going to find. Uh, but we may be able to hunt things down. We may be able to research and find out where certain undead survive. If I had my choice, I would target a Nightwalker. So Nightwalker has a charisma saving throw of minus one. So it's almost certainly going to fail. It has an intelligence score of six, which means it's not going to get advantage on that roll. And it doesn't get an additional roll. Nightwalker has 297 hit points. Speed of 40 feet, fly of 40 feet, damage resistances to a lot of things, damage immunities, condition immunities to all kinds of things, exhaustion, frightened, grappled, paralyzed, petrified, poisoned, prone, restrained, dark vision 120 feet. It has an aura that does damage, probably want to keep it away from the rest of the party, and it has insanely powerful attacks. This is a challenge rating 18 creature, uh, and if we target it with that ability, it's almost certainly ours. So that's kind of a best case scenario. I wouldn't count on that happening. If I'm a DM, it's going to be pretty hard for you to find Nightwalker. You might expect to gain a number of levels before you find one. I'm definitely not giving you a pet Nightwalker at 14th level. So we're going to get four 7th level spells, two preparations. So what we're going to take here is Crown of Stars. Again, it's something that's not going to require our concentration. And we can kill things with it, potentially, and if we do... Because it's a 7th level spell, that's a 14 hit point regain. Of course I'm going to take Force Cage. Be crazy not to take Force Cage. Uh, so I'm not crazy, I'm taking Force Cage. Obviously I'm going to take Simulacrum. I'm a wizard. Simulacrum is there, I'm taking it. And then the final spell I'm going to take, this one should be a surprise. It's Finger of Death. Maybe not a huge surprise, we are a Necromancer. Uh, but this is a spell I would not take with a non-Necromancer. Uh, but with a Necromancer, I think it's worth taking. 60 foot range. You send negative energy coursing through a creature that you can see within range, causing it searing pain. The target must make a constitution saving throw. Take 78 plus 30 necrotic damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. So on average, that's 61 or 62 points of damage, half that on a successful saving throw. So that's not bad damage, but we're not targeting a great saving throw. Uh, and we are using a very high level spell to do that damage. Uh, but the thing is, is a humanoid kill by the spell rises at the start of your next turn as a zombie that is permanently under your control, following your verbal orders to the best of its ability. So in off time, we can make ourselves a zombie army. And because we get undead thralls on any necromancy spell that creates undead, finger of death applies, which means that all these zombies are all going to benefit from our undead thralls, but they're not going to require us to cast spells to maintain control. So, at least potentially, we could have an indefinite number of zombies. And then we can finger of death the humanoid, turn him into a zombie, and then soul cage him as well. Really, this character is just a beacon of goodness, aren't they? So as a combat spell, I don't know how often I'd use it. If I thought that that spellcaster, who happens to be a humanoid, is close to going down, then I might cast it just because I can guarantee a reasonable amount of hit point damage, and it's not easy to counterspell. Uh, but in general, I would probably save it mostly for non-adventuring times when I'm going to be casting it and building my army. I can prepare two of these spells. As I mentioned, uh, Finger Death, probably some I'm not doing during an adventure. Simulate from same thing. Uh, so Force Cage and Crown of Stars will be my preparations. So let's go to 16th level. We're so close to that 9th level spell I want to talk about. Uh, but we're going to go to 16th level right now. Gets our ability score improvement. This is big because we're finally getting our intelligence up to 20. So now we've caught up with all those other wizards. We have a 20 intelligence 16th level. Now we're going to go into our spells and pick our 8th level spells. Spells I like here. Some of them are going to be pretty obvious and repeats from previous wizards. Demiplane I always like. Maze I always like. Mind Blank I always like. Uh, but what I am going to do here is take Antipathy, Sympathy, and I just want to mention, I, I've taken Antipathy, Sympathy before. It's a great way, when you're not adventuring, to layer up control over things. Uh, and 
we can use this also on our undead. Let's just keep that in mind. It can be a way to force enemies towards the undead and away from you, or it could be a way to just protect your undead. Uh, so that is another way we can use Antipathy Sympathy, though I would still probably use it on myself and PCs. So I want to talk a little bit extra about Demiplane. Uh, Demiplane, I've already talked about many times, for its usefulness in travel, for its usefulness in things like storage. Uh, but with a Necromancer, don't forget, we can store undead or components for undead. So you come across a bunch of bodies, throw them in your Demiplane. You have some undead and you want to get them through the town without them being noticed, throw them in your Demiplane. Uh, Demiplane is a great way for Necromancers to deal with their undead. Thought I'd mention that. In terms of preparation, let's just prepare all the ones that we might want to cast. So Demiplane, Maze, and Mind Blank. At this point, I really just want to jump to 18th level. Let's do it. So we go from 16th to 18th level. We now have access to 9th level spells. But first, we have Spell Mastery. So we can cast a 2nd and a 1st level spell, and they're not going to use our spell slots anymore. Misty Step makes a lot of sense here, as does Shield. So let's grab those two. We're definitely going to get lots of use out of both of those. So we can take 4 ninth level spells here. And the first spell I'm going to take, and you know what it is, it's Shape Change. Yeah, no, the first spell I'm going to take is definitely Shape Change. I mean, I'm going to take Wish too, and I'm still going to take True Polymorph. Uh, and then I'm also going to take Psychic Scream, and I'll talk about that, but I'll tell you when I get to 17th level, the first spell I'm writing down is Shape Change, and it's the spell I want to use with my 9th level slot. And why do I want that? Because I'm going to cast Shape Change, and when you cast Shape Change, you get the innate spell casting of the creature whose form you took. So for Challenge Rating 16, which means we can take this form right now, we have this guy. He's called... Titivalis. Titivalis. So this is what I was going to talk about Tativilus. Uh Tativilus is a creature that is able to cast Animate Dead at will, uh, as an in innate spell casting, which means that, technically speaking, if you were to cast Shape Change, uh, which lasts an hour, uh, and then you were to cast Animate Dead over and over, which, which has a casting time of one minute, then that means you could cast Animate Dead 60 times if you were in the form of Tativilus. Uh, and the good thing is, of course, that because you get your class abilities, then when you cast Animate Dead each time, you would get Undead Thralls, which means now you could get up to 120 zombies or skeletons upgraded with your necromancy abilities with one casting of a spell. So you get an army of undead just by taking this one form. And as I was making this video, it occurred to me that there is a significant problem here. And the problem is that because Anime Dead has a one minute casting time, it requires concentration to cast. Even though Anime Dead doesn't require concentration to maintain, once you cast it, those creatures are created, the casting time itself will require concentration because any spell that requires more than one action to cast requires a concentration. Which means when we're shape changed, which also requires a concentration, we can't cast this spell. So the big thing I was looking so forward to, it doesn't work. It's so disappointing. But I figure I better just mention it, uh, that it doesn't work, rather than put it out there and have you guys find out the hard way. So uh, to Tivolus as a shape change, it's not a bad shape change, but there's no special advantage to doing it with a Necromancer. <sighs> now, I also took Psychic Scream. So what does Psychic Scream do? You unleash the power of your mind to blast the intellect of up to 10 creatures of your choice you can see within range. Creatures that have an intelligence score of 2 or less are unaffected. Each target must make an intelligence saving throw. That's a good one to target. On failed save, they take 14d6 psychic damage and are stunned. 14d6 isn't a huge amount, uh, but psychic is a good type of damage. It's something that we normally don't do. And stun is great. On a successful save, the target takes half as much damage and isn't stunned. If a target is killed by this damage, it is head explodes, which is always nice to see, uh, assuming it has one. A stunned target can make an intelligence saving throw at the end of each of its turns. On a successful save, the stunning effect ends. So this is like a mass stun. You can get 10 creatures and potentially stun all of them, and it is an intelligence saving throw, so it's not easy to resist. And then on top of that, you get to do some additional damage, and maybe a head will explode. In terms of prepared, I'm always going to prepare shape change with this build. Uh, now I'm going to get one additional preparation at this level. Uh, so at this level, what I'd probably do is prepare Wish, uh, because Wish just is so versatile. 
but we're going to gain two more levels that's going to increase our preparations uh, we don't have a lot of lower level spells or other ninth level spells that we're going to want to cast with this character so we're probably looking at rituals now which makes it so that we can eventually have all these prepared so it's a little anticlimactic but let's go to level 20. we get a final ability score improvement you can put this wherever you want. If you find that you're failing a lot of concentration saves, then you probably want to put it in something like Warcaster. Uh, I like Lucky here. Lucky is just going to be where I want it to be. It's one of those things that I don't know necessarily what I'm going to want, uh, but Lucky's always going to be useful. And then I'm going to get Signature Spells. This is going to give me two third level spells. Uh, they are automatically prepared, so it's like two additional preparations. In addition, we can cast them without using a spell slot once, and we can do so again after a short rest. So the first one I think is a good choice is Counterspell, right? Counterspell comes up. It's nice to have it. Nice to have it always prepared. I'd certainly want it prepared. Uh, and the second one I'll choose is Animate Dead. And the reason we'll choose that is because it just gives us more castings of Animate Dead. Uh, because we can still use our regular spell slots for Animate Dead, and we still likely are. Uh, but we can also now use uh, an additional casting without using a spell slot, and after we take a short rest, we can cast again and get another additional casting without using a spell slot. During an adventuring day, your undead are going to die, right? They don't have a ton of hit points. They're going to die, and what's going to happen is you're going to take a short rest, you can cast another Animate Dead for free, and bring three more up. So we're going to get four additional spells. What do we want? It doesn't matter all that much, but I like having the clone spell on my list, so we'll grab that one. Uh, this character doesn't have a teleport, so let's grab teleport. Let's grab plane shift as well, depending which one we need. And let's grab magic jar. So at 20th level, this is what my preparations look like in the end. Uh, we're going to have our first level, absorb elements, mage armor, and shield prepared. Uh, second level, we're going to have our mirror image and our misty step prepared. Third level, we've got Animate Dead and Counterspell prepared. Uh, fourth level, we've got Arcane Eye, Autoluke's Resilient Sphere prepared. Uh, we also have Watery Sphere prepared. Uh, fifth level, we have Dance Macabre, uh, Transmute Rock, Wall of Force. Uh, sixth level, Create Undead, Scatter, Soul Cage. Seventh level, Crown of Stars and Force Cage. Eighth level, Demiplane, Maze, Mind Blanco. And then at ninth level, Psychic Scream, Shape Change, True Polymorph and Wish. Let's prepare them all, and we'll use the one we need. And that's the Necromancer. So next week, we're going to be doing the Pacifist Wizard, and that is a Transmuter Wizard that does not do damage with any of their spells. And they're essentially going to be a Pacifist in combat that they're in no way harming other creatures. Now, that doesn't mean they're not going to affect the battlefield. That doesn't mean they're not going to do things like trap enemies and those kinds of things. Uh, certainly, we're still helping our allies in combat. Uh, but I've had, over the years, people ask me about making wizards that don't do damage in combat. Is that viable? It is. I'll show you next week with the Transmuter Wizard. Until then, I'm going to sit back and relax, have some fun. D&D &D is for everyone. Thanks, everyone. See you next week. Mm -hmm.